Hello everyone, welcome back to The Request. It's me, Captain Logan, and also, as always, my co-host, Austin the Day Ghost. And Austin, tonight we get to get back to comics, isn't that exciting? Yeah, uh, and one I'd never even heard of before we got this request. Yeah, I was familiar with these covers, but I didn't know what this book was. Mm -hmm. I had, for some reason, I had seen these. In fact, I thought maybe I owned one, but I went back and looked at I, I don't, I don't have these. I'll probably buy them now, but I didn't have them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I saw somebody say uh, in the post you made in the community chat about the show that, like, I guess it's also like out of print too. So it's also like a harder book to find. Yeah, I looked it up because I want to get this in singles, and they're uh, reasonably uh, priced. They're pretty inexpensive. But when you start going to the trades, the the, the trades are higher, and the hardcover is kind of nuts. It, it's it's one of those like really rare, hard to get your hands on kind of hardcovers. Oh, okay. It's, it's like, like a RoboCop versus Terminator, where it's like a thousand dollars. It's not like that, but it's like it's like a ninety or a hundred dollar hardcover. Oh, okay. I think that's what I saw. At cursory glance. I don't buy a lot in trade, so but it was one of those things that being I like shorter and self contained. I was like, well, I'll look up both because this is a thing I could see getting in hardcover, even though I tend to I tend to get singles, but. Mm -hmm. I'm a lot more selective about what I buy these days because I've got so much digital access. So I'm a little bit stingier about what I buy. But um, I guess I'm giving away my feelings a little bit and saying that I like this enough to go ahead and probably put it in my collection. Yeah, um, I definitely would like to buy it at some point too. Uh, this comes out in 2004, and it's uh, written by Kurt Busick with art by Stuart Amonin, both guys that I typically like. Uh, I think Amonin's art in this is really good. Uh, I, I I like I like the the sketchy uh, kind of uh, not like ultra detailed thing he's doing, but uh, the, the the style really fits the kind of yeah I want to say like the the realistic tone of the book, but it's not super realistic artwork. Mm hmm. Well, it's funny because, and I think I talked about it when we did the um, Ultimate Spider-Man uh, trade. And also now I'm messed up because I always thought it was imminent. And now I'm like, uh, do I have it wrong? You know, maybe it is. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, Stuart, I... Um, Don't assume he... I'm right, Austin. Uh, you have more skin in the game. I assume you're right. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm to a point where I couldn't begin to tell you if it's Mark Miller or Mark Millar. Everybody says Miller, but there's those couple of guys I always heard say Millar, and so and so that's that's how I. It, it, and and it's it's just uh, I don't know with with him like it's easier to refer to him as Millar. We have all these other Millers running around, but I think it's actually pronounced Miller. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I've heard both pronunciations from guests on his interview show. <laughs> he says Miller, so I. I assume that's correct well, but yeah I, I think you can go with his pronunciation of his own name so what we need he's to do also is scottish so like i don't know oh well there you go yeah <laughs> then it's like well that's the correct pronunciation colloquially <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So what we need to do is find an interview with Stuart Imonen and see if it's Imonen or Imonen. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I dare people in the live comments right now to try to explain to us how to say it phonetically. <laughs> Good luck. It's yeah, exactly. it's imminent with an I. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I only know him from Ultimate Spider-Man, where he takes over uh, from Bagley, and I've always been like, ah, like I kind of lose interest once Bagley leaves. But he's a good artist. It's just that that book is so tied to like Bagley and Bendis that it was hard for me to adjust with it. Yeah, I mean that, uh, that doesn't always speak to somebody's quality of work mm -hmm. it's just no, you want this, this book is... to look like this book has looked yeah and i think this is you know very much proof of that because i think this book's gorgeous yeah it's great uh and the it, it has a real distinct style and it's the kind of style that uh works better for uh, this kind of understated again more real worldy thing where i i think there's another uh, way you could have gone with this where you made everything look like photorealistic Mm -hmm. Almost like a Brian Hitch or someone like that. Yeah, or I'm I'm even thinking Marvels because this is Kurt Busiek. Like you, oh, like Alex Ross. Alex Ross. Yeah, you could have gone the Marvels direction with it. Mm -hmm. When I was also thinking of that, 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 what's that Marvel book we read? Uh, Earth X. Earth X. Yeah. I don't know why, but I was thinking about that a little bit when reading this. There's a couple of things where I'm like, 
uh, this is maybe more influential than it uh, than people realize. Well, and again, this is so understated that I think I prefer this art style to something like this. I, I guess I'm saying you could go for a realistic to give it more of that real world quality, right? Where mm -hmm. it's it's a comic book, but it's not real comic booky. Like this reads more like graphic novel than comic book. Mm -hmm. If that yeah, makes I know any exactly. sense. And so with the with something like Marvel's with the Alex Ross look, I uh, you're you're painting this like really larger than life picture of these like mythological characters with real world people looking at them from the ground. Mm -hmm. And this has more of like a I uh, it not that it looks like this time period, but this is more like a 40s 50s like Americana sort of piece. Mm -hmm. It's very uh, Spider-Man life story. Like it has that uh, like issue set up where like or that is very much this. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, like there's no way they weren't looking at this, right? Yeah, must have been. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you you said that you hadn't really heard of this before. This is not a book I hear bandied about a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like, I didn't even really know the premise. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I think you told me the premise like. At some point after, maybe like after you read the first issue or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, because I wasn't actually familiar with it, and it makes. I'm interested to give Creature of a Night of the Night another look, uh, which I read when it came out, but that colors that book in a whole other way because it's sort of like uh, this for Batman. So Kurt Busiek comes back in 18 and does another, I think, four part miniseries with oversized issues about a little kid I who is named Bruce Wainwright, and he's obsessed with Batman, and he kind of becomes Batman, but in more of, like, a metaphorical sort of way. Um, and I haven't read it in a long time, so I can't speak to it a, a lot. And actually, I don't know if I ever finished it. I was buying it when it came out. I read at least half of it. I never reviewed it. Okay, uh, I'd like to check that out then, yeah. I, I think you and I should maybe try to get that on the docket somewhere. Uh, yeah, sure. Shortly after this, if we can find a place for it, we're, mm -hmm. we're having a tough time sneaking in comics. But I want to be reviewing comics more often. It's it's kind of driving me crazy because we've always been kind of a comic channel, and mm -hmm. lately comics are only coming up when people request them, and I don't like that. It's kind of driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been I've been wanting to do IDW Ninja Turtles this year. We're already into April. <laughs> oh, That's Neil, a character yeah. from Ninja Turtles, and I haven't gotten started on it. I started reading it again, but I haven't been able to sneak it. Of course, I'm trying to make the movie, and I've, I've got, uh, you know, new baby and stuff, so we're, we're doing what we can do, but uh, all of that just to say I, if we can find a place to put it, I think it would be really cool right after this to, to read Creature of the Night, because it's kind of the companion to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was a big thing I was thinking about while reading this, because you had told me that there was a Batman, oh, I'm sorry, uh, that there was a Batman one, so I was like, I want to see what that looks like. Yeah, and it's cool because it's not the exact same story, or it's not mm. the exact kind of thing. And I'm pretty it sure it's very different. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure. It, well, yeah, because otherwise, what's the point? Mm -hmm. well, and, uh, well, and also the premise of this is a, a guy acts, a guy suddenly unceremoniously gets superpowers. You can't do that with Batman. Like, how does your how, how does your Bruce Wayne counterpart become Batman? It would have to be a choice he makes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like, just like the premise of both characters, it's a completely different idea. Like, I guess you could have done a thing where you have, like, a teenager or a young adult who is, who reads a lot of Batman and is named that, or, or named something like that, and goes, well, I mean, I could do that, and then he figures out a way to become Batman. You could, you could do that version. Or he becomes, like, a vampire or something. Yeah, I, it's called Creature of the Night. <laughs> I guess, sure. I don't know. Uh, yeah, because the, the premise with that is there's, like, a bat creature that comes to him and I uh, inspires him to do whatever it is he does in that book. It's been too long, and it, it, it's played like we don't know if the creature is real or not, but it's played like maybe it's in his head, and that's why I said it's kind of metaphorical. Uh, but I don't think I... I maybe didn't read far enough to even get the payoff of what exactly the creature is. So, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that when and if we actually read it. Hayden Spring uh, requested this tonight on Patreon. Thanks a lot to him. He's in the comments right now. He says, I'm happy you weren't super familiar with it. And he says he likes this more than Creature of the Night, but he likes that also. And he says he was going to request it, but he's not going to if he doesn't have to. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> I don't want to wait five months to read that. Yeah, either way, even if we don't do we it, have like a long I'll, I'll probably right now, read so. it. Yeah, you'll go ahead and read it even if we don't actually mm -hmm. talk about it, but... Maybe we can sneak it in someplace.
yeah, fit it in somewhere. Anyway, let's go ahead and talk about this. Like I said, <laughs> it's a four-issue miniseries, but that's a little bit misleading because like Marvel's, like Creature of the Night, it is uh, thicker uh, issues. So I, I wasn't, I was reading this digitally, so I didn't get the page counts, but it, it felt like 40 or 50. Yeah, it was about that. And now, Austin is going to give us a plot synopsis. Uh, yeah, so this book is about a uh, kid from Kansas uh, who is named Clark Kent, so everybody buys him Superman things because he's Clark Kent, and uh, he hates it. He's like, I, I don't know why my uh, parents think they're funny. They're not, uh, but everybody plays into it. I can't escape it. Did you and mention then, that he actually lives in a small town in Kansas? What's that, sir? Did, did you mention that he actually lives in a small town in Kansas? Um, I mentioned he was in Kansas. I didn't say it was a small town. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, I, was, no, okay. I was pulling this up. I just want to make sure that part got in there. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because what's the small town called? It starts with a P. Uh, um, it's Pickettsville. It, Pickettsville, yeah, which is also yeah. a fake Kansas town. Oh, okay. I assumed it was a real place. Well, I'll look it up, but I'm almost positive <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a real place. Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, if it is, so... I've never heard of it, and I live in Kansas, so there you go. <laughs> uh, so he, when he, he's a teenager, he gains Superman powers, and then uh, it's a lot of him kind of decide or like trying to figure out why he has powers. Yeah, that's not a real place. And when you look it up, the first thing that comes up is Superman's secret identity. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, that's interesting. They picked a fake place then, because uh, our stand-in for Metropolis is New York. Yeah, I wonder what the uh, logic was behind that. Mm -hmm. Because in some ways we're, we're like, intentionally trying to put this as much in the real world, world as possible. And in some ways it's it's a, it's another, like, kind of once-removed kind of thing where you could almost see this as a another uh, Earth in the pantheon of DC Earths, right? Like, it could be part of the multiverse, I guess. Mm -hmm. so especially as it goes on. Um, like you end up with a more comic booky world as it goes, and not as much as I thought it we were gonna get to. But when, when, I had that too. When yeah. you get the end, when you get to the end, you get a. Sorry, I don't want you to get back to your synopsis. But when you get to the end, you you get your uh, like like a like a short laundry list of uh, like vague power sets that you could maybe attribute to different characters, and you could see this as you know suggesting that this is a DC universe and this Clark Kent turns out to be the the real Superman in that world, and so maybe there's a Batman, maybe there's a Green Lantern, a Flash, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't get into all of that. We just know that there are metahumans now. They don't, they don't even call them that, but, like, like we, we know that there are people with superpowers. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. That I guess all, got, all came from various <laughs> meteors. Yeah, it's never really explained, and I'm glad it's kind of vague. Like, I like how they play that. Me too. There, there's a throwaway possible kind of goofy explanation about how you get the coincidence of a guy named Clark Kent gets exactly Superman's powers, but it does not matter. It's a conceit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. No, and I think there's like a few ways that it could go, but... Yeah, the big suggestion is there's a meteor that gives you powers and your what whatever you're thinking about i uh, can influence the power set you get mm -hmm. and, yeah like that's the closest we get to an explanation for it yeah and there's also some talk about like government experimentation too so like that could be it as well like it's yeah but we know that the government doesn't give him his powers so like there's other people that that could happen to but he mm -hmm. gets powers and the government is experimenting on him or, or wants to experiment on him because they want to find out what it is. Like they didn't do it pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they could, it could have been like something where they do something in an area or something. And then oh, like, yeah, maybe, I... you know, it's, it's definitely vague, but you're right. Like but, that is like, but the... then it's too much of a coincidence that he gets exactly Superman's powers, mm -hmm. which is why I think Busick felt the need to throw in that real quick throwaway thing about, well, he's thinking about Superman and that gives him Superman's powers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably it. There's no other possible... Again, it does not matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, he has powers, so he starts to, like, help people when he can. And he has to keep his secret identity. And the big thing that kind of tracks out the whole book is uh, he's a writer, and he's kind of writing down his exploits. Uh, but I'll just kind of break it down in terms of, like, the important things, like, yeah, it reads in each kind of like issue. A, it reads kind of like a comic book memoir. 
Mm -hmm. It absolutely does. Uh, so in the first issue, you have your kind of high school shenanigans where you, like there's the girl he likes at school, and he's trying to balance his powers and he wants to tell her like it's very Spider Man y. Uh, there was a point where I was like, okay, like this is gonna be like a very Spider Man take on Superman, and then the time jump happens, so we kind of lose some of that. Yeah, he gets away from that after he's a teenager. It, it even has that period of maybe I could make money with this. Maybe there's <laughs> fame and fortune. Thompson, too. And he has, yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> but he, you, you know, he, he thinks for a split second about, you know, all, all the advantages that he could have with this. And he even, like a Peter Parker would, I uh, can considers, I uh, like making himself public so that he can, I, uh, you know, gain something from it. And then something happens that makes him decide that that's a bad, irresponsible idea. Mm -hmm. and he, he puts helping other people in front of the advantages that he could get from it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which comes down to a relationship he has with essentially comic book Lois Lane, uh, who's like probably like one of the closer things you have to a villain uh, in the book. It's not really like a super villain thing, but like that's kind of his first villain. Another thing I was expecting that we didn't end up doing. Yeah, same here. <laughs> um, so that's kind of like his high school thing, and then we jump forward, and then uh, he meets like his actual Lois. Um, Before you you move on, just for folks yeah. that haven't read this, because we we always spoil stuff. I I just I just want to mention what what Austin's talking about for a second, because because it, it's a cool idea. You have a uh, when he says comic book Lois Lane, he means there is a journalist who I uh, is thinking she's getting her big break by discovering the superpowered kid. And you do kind of like the interview with Superman type thing. And then that relationship goes sour and you see that uh, she's kind of uh, using him to uh, break into her career. Well, she sets up a catastrophe at a, at a town fair uh, mm -hmm. or where, or whatever it is in order to uh, get him to out himself and use his powers, which is cool because that's actually when he was going to do it. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then he saves the girl he has a crush on and has to pretend like he doesn't have powers I, uh, because he doesn't, you know, want this woman to be able to make her name on him. And it, it would be a bad idea at that point to get outed. Yeah, exactly. He's like, oh, people are are exposing me. It there, there's a there's a small little episode in the first season about a cop uh, that 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 does this, um, or well, I mean, he's like a lot more evil. But it but it, it kind of reminded me of that. By the way, just overall, the tone of this is what I always wanted Smallville to be. This is um, yeah, I can see that. This is yeah. like exactly what that show should have been. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that would have been great. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so then we jump uh, into time, and uh, we get uh, this version of Clark's actual Lois, who is not a journalist. She's a... Um, interior designer. Interior designer, yes, thank you. Um, and the other big thing in that section is the government's after Superman. And at this point, he is wearing a Superman costume with the idea that he doesn't want people to see him, so... The idea is that he swoops in super fast, and even if they do, it's like, oh, yeah, I saw Superman fly out of the sky and saved me. Now you look like a crazy person. It's the best possible uh, excuse to get him in costume. Mm -hmm. It's kind, of, it's kind of brilliant, and it's and it's effortless, and it's like exactly what it should be. Like I don't know if I would have thought of it, but it's really smart because they're like, well, if it's a world where there's a fictional Superman like our world, and Again, it basically is our world where you have, I mean, no other DC Comics things are mentioned, but Superman's just this popular character that you could read comics and watch shows and things. And mm. so if even if multiple people all had accounts with it, it would it would be like aliens. Nobody would believe you because it's not just, oh, somebody from space or somebody that can fly came down and saved me. It's Superman's. Like, well, Superman's not real. We all know that. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so the government's trying to get Superman, and then they do, and they're doing experiments on him. And he gets out, and he has to kind of juggle with what he's going to do because now the government's after him, and he's kind of got to go underground. And the big like finale with that is that he tells Lois who he is, 
and because uh, he's got they, that classic con- conflict where he's trying to decide if, if he's going to tell her his secret ad- identity or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So then we jump into the future again, and merc- mercifully, we don't have to sit around for you know pages and pages and pages waiting for him to make that decision or have a lot of forced uh, you know relationship drama and conflict over it. Uh, mm-hmm. th- this is the most um, reasonable a love interest is with that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I always prefer to see it played this way. <laughs> and, cer- and certainly, sometimes there is understandable drama that comes out of that mm-hmm. uh, in in things, but I just, I just really like how uh, reasonable she is. Like, I'm jumping ahead a little bit when I say this, but, like, she's pretty understanding about why he doesn't tell her in the first place, and I don't know that she would have been if he'd waited too much longer. Like, they, they just, they probably just wouldn't have had a relationship. Like, he almost breaks it off. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that whole se- section is really sad. Like, I, I really feel bad for him, because I don't know what you do in that situation. It, it's, a, it's a really good ethical conundrum. And then... Later on, when she has, when when she delivers and has their children, and he can't be there because he's saving people, she's perfectly reasonable, and I really appreciated that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we jump forward in time, and that's kind of the big thing in that section. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. Is that uh, she's pregnant and they have kids? I don't know how to not review as I go. <laughs> And uh, our version of Superman, he uh, knowing that he has kids coming, he goes, okay, the government's after me because they're kind of the villain up to this point uh, after that kind of first lowest parallel. And uh, he's like, okay, well, I have to make good with this. Uh, So he ends up basically making a deal with the government that he'll help them out uh, if they don't, uh, you know, come after him. And there's still like shady things they're doing and whatnot, but he almost gets like a Gordon out of it, which is uh, Malloy is his name. Yes. And uh, they have him kind of doing jobs for the government. And then we jump forward again in time uh, for the last issue where now he's older, his kids have grown up, and now they have powers. Sorry, this this guy in the middle of this page looks like your Stan Lee cameo. <laughs> uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> and then uh, the father becomes the son, and the son becomes the father. Yes, I'm so it's all a cycle, that. sunrise, sunset. That's it. And that's the book. <laughs> Yeah, except uh, the the big twist is the the uh, daughters become the like the 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 fa- the daughters become the father, I guess. Because mm-hmm. yeah, he, he has, has two fathers. Because he has because da- he has daughters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. He's got twins, and then they have children, which Cav very much related to. He was like, I can understand what it's like to have twin daughters. I related to all of the family stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, but yeah, no, I liked this book a lot. I thought it was really great. And uh, what I liked about it is that it took me a little bit to kind of get wh- what the book was doing. So it was like, you know, I re- read the first issue and it was like, okay, uh, we're doing like a spider man thing where it's going to be like a Superman in high school. And then, oh, no, uh, now we're in New York and he's an older guy. Okay, now it's going to be like, a, you know, the real government is uh, – kind of scary and this is what they would do in that situation oh no not exactly because he made peace with that as well and it ends up just being like you said like it's very memoirish like it's just this is this man's life like it is like i said earlier i will i'd be shocked if they weren't looking at this book for a life story and i think this is a better version of that yeah, and that was a long time ago now uh, when we reviewed that, so I don't remember a ton about that book. I remember liking it okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a book where I really like the first three issues, and then it starts to dip a little bit once it hits the 90s, like actual Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot that it was through decades like that. And this is too, but it's not making a big emphasis about the time periods. Yeah, and then your last issue, it's not in one spot like the uh, the rest of them are. That one's very much like, a, okay, this is kind of the rest of his life, and we may do a few time jumps even in the last issue. This also is a lot less meta than that. I don't know if that's the right word, but like that if memory serves that book is a little bit more nostalgia driven than this. Well, that's very much like it's in the decades and each decade is like adapting something that actually happened in that decade. And this you kind of have an element of that, but at the end where it's like him and his daughters are flying together and they go through the decades of Superman art uh, as they're flying. And yeah. that was a really cool moment. But yeah, that's almost like that life story idea, but in a scene. That's a good point. The the and besides that, the only real nostalgia stuff that you have besides 
uh, references to names and things, which which I, pre- I appreciate that it's not just name drops where it's like, uh, oh, you're a Superman fan, so you're going to really appreciate that we said Lana or Laura or or who or, or Kara or whoever. Um, it's it's always like driven by the characters, and it's about this. I uh, this conceit of well he's got the name Clark Kent so people are constantly teasing him about Superman so those examples come up because they have to mm-hmm. but the only other place where you get that is you've got a big splash page I uh, and it's done in a couple other places but mostly it's a big splash page at the beginning of each issue that shows you I uh, a like golden age moment and that is reflected thematically in the issue somehow. And most of them, if not all of them, I can't remember now, just just one one read, I uh, they're they're also in scene somehow. So it isn't just showing you a golden age scene and then now we're gonna do something with that in the book. It's also like, oh, somebody gave Clark a Christmas ornament with a Santa Claus Superman, and then that's gonna be and then it's gonna be about his mortality and getting older and eventually he'll actually have a beard and be an elderly superman flying around yeah exactly and uh it's also nice because you have those references but it's also from the point of view of somebody who doesn't like superman yeah Uh, i really like the part uh when he meets like his actual lois and um, he's like, oh, man, like, I've been set up with so many Loises and Lanas and once with a Cat Grant. And she goes, is that a Superman thing? And he goes, look, I don't know, but they thought it was really <laughs> He goes, it must be. I, I assume so. <laughs> it must be. They thought it was funny. I don't get it. But <laughs> Yeah, there were a couple places where characters that clearly aren't comic readers would know something that felt like a slightly too deep pull for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, there probably is. But it's really minor. Like, not that, but but there were... I'm forgetting now what... But there, there was, like, an example or two, like, as as I was reading, where I was like, I don't know if, if you know, like, your average person would be familiar with with this. Like, I like I wonder how much Clark... The, this Clark has, has actually, you know, gone ahead and read and delved into stuff. Because, like, he knows who Pete Ross and Lana Lang are. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, I mean, Lana Lang, maybe. I'm not sure why you know who Pete Ross is. Oh yeah, um, one of my favorites is he sits with the jocks because they don't know anything with the geeks, and then the he sits down with them and they're like, "Yo, who who was the original Teen Titans? Uh, like Robin, uh, Kid Flash, Aqualad, or does Wonder Girl count?" And I was like, "Would they know that? <laughs> would, would that be a thing that they'd be asking?" <laughs> I did have that with that moment. <laughs> well, no, those were the geeks though. No, he's with the jocks. I, did I read it wrong? Because I thought I thought the idea. I'm gonna go back and look at it because I think you're wrong. Uh, cause I because I because I thought the idea was he was being made fun of by the jocks, so he went and sat with the geeks because they didn't judge. They weren't judgmental, and then they're oh, okay, so and they're Superman it. fans, and he doesn't know what the heck they're talking about. Maybe I just misread it, but I thought it was the jocks because they're like we don't care about any of this stuff, so they're not the ones that are gonna think of things. But I could have that completely flipped around. Again, one read. You have to go back and look at it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but there is also the Flash Thompson guy makes like a Metallo joke while they're driving by. That was thanks. I'm glad you said that. I'm like he would know what that is. <laughs> There's no like Austin hardly knows who Metallo is, and Austin's a comic reader. Hey, I know Metallo. <laughs> If he said Bibbo, I'd be like, okay, I know who that is, but like barely. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't you. I I had somebody on not too long ago where I said something about Top Metallo. They were like, I don't even know who that is. Uh, it was probably Brandon. <laughs> it probably was Brandon. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, to, to your point about uh, this constantly – kind of going in different directions than maybe you expected where you had to keep adjusting your expectations. I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought it was a full on origin, like, like a, you know, w- what if somebody in more or less our world became Superman and then gets a Superman origin. And so I figured the end of this book was going to be, he finally accepts being Superman and it's a coming of age story. And it is this, but then it goes on further, right? Where it's a coming of age story about uh, a kid that doesn't appreciate the Superman or even the idea of superheroes in general, uh, because he's been made fun of about that his his whole life, and so he's not interested. And then 
he, however you want to read it, he either discovers heroic and selfless values through being Superman, or I. Uh, having to be Superman makes him realize that he always had those values and that he, in fact, is Clark Kent. I think I, either of those reads works. But then after the second issue, it goes further than that, and it, it eventually becomes, like, an Old Man Logan thing. Not that it's, like, you know, depressing or sad or anything, but just now you've got, like, a like an older Superman um, dealing with, uh, you know, his powers not being what they used to be and getting, you know, dealing with his mortality and all of that. And so it or ends like, up being you know, more biopic where it goes through his whole life. Mm -hmm. Or like uh, All-Star, if he was getting less powerful instead of being, like, supercharged like he is in that. Oh, yeah, that too. Uh, and he was probably thinking of All-Star because that was just right before this, wasn't it? Um, I assume so. I, I don't know uh, when this book came it's out. It's right before or right after. So this came out in 04. I can't remember if All Star is 02 or 03 or if it's a little bit later than that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm so bad with my dates. It's, well, it's just been too long for me. I'm rusty. Mm -hmm. I just know that that comes out before All Star Batman and Robin. Well, and that's... That's like mid-2000s. 2008, 2009, yeah. Oh, okay, so I'm even wrong about that. <laughs> well, or maybe a little bit, because the problem with All-Star Batman is that book is always late and takes forever to come out, and then it just <laughs> ends unceremoniously. Yeah, so... it just doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, five. So this actually predates All-Star by a year. Oh, okay, cool. So that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe Morrison's looking at this a little bit. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll discover that this is like really influential, but nobody in our circles talks about it. <laughs> it feels like one of those, uh, cause you'll have books or like movies or whatever, where it's not super well remembered by like the audience, but it is by creators. You know what I mean? Where it's like a creator's book or movie or whatever. I feel like this is probably one of those. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like identity crisis was like that for a long time. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Robert Wild two dollars super chat. Uh, Cap can relate since he was named after Wolverine. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat. Uh, that's that's hilarious. No, I I did, I did not growing up. I did not grow up having people make fun of me for being Wolverine. And furthermore, it took me a long time to even realize that I had two thirds of Wolverine's name. Well, it probably helps that I, uh, James Howlett comes out later. No, or is that like a thing established then? So. I need to finally look this up and know for sure because we were, we're talking about this. We've been doing so much X Men lately. We just talked about this a couple weeks ago, and I still don't remember. I, I, I'm still not sure if James Logan Howlett starts in Origin or if that's a thing that predates Origin. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know enough about Wolverine. I learned about it reading Origin, but that doesn't <laughs> mean that's where it came from. Either way, not something. Uh, I think even the general audience knows now. No, certainly not. Well, that that's a thing I was going to bring. Uh, tonight on, on Request, Cap looks up things. Cap, <laughs> Cap Googles stuff. Cap wikis. Cap can't wiki. That should be a new show. Uh, no, I can. Cap just can't remember, like, in the first place. <laughs> Uh, it might take me a bit to figure out where that came up uh, for. So at some point when you're being long winded and I don't care, I will, I will figure this out, but it, I'm, just okay. but, but, okay. I'm joking. But anyway, I uh, no, I'm, I, I'm glad that you, that, that you mentioned that uh, about how, like if this happened with a character, like say Wolverine, uh, if your name was James Logan Howlett, you would maybe get made fun of by some comic readers. More likely, people would just be like, wow, your parents are cool. Like, they gave you a kick-ass name, right? Uh, he picked a subject where I actually buy that everybody brings it up. Mm -hmm. No, because with, like, uh, Wolverine, it would be like, some nerds would be like, uh, you know, <laughs> Wolverine, <laughs> James Logan, and you'd be like, okay, virgin. Uh, <laughs> with Clark Kent, everybody knows who that is. It's like Bruce Wayne or Peter Parker. I especially post the first Donner movie. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Absolutely. like even before that, everybody knows who Clark Kent is. After that, especially, like I buy that people that have never picked up a comic or maybe maybe even seen anything with Superman in it. If your name is Clark Kent, everybody brings that up. Everybody is making fun of it. And there wasn't any aspect of that that I thought was overdone. I Now, somebody, I, I think, uh, 
Hayden Spring uh, in the comments earlier uh, said that his only issue with this book, and I had this too, was he didn't really buy that Lois keeps getting set up on dates with Clarks. Because her name is not Lois Lane. It's just, she just has the first name Lois. And mm-hmm. both things can't be true, right? Where I uh, Clark keeps getting set up on dates with people named Lois. And we're told, like, twice as many as Lana's. Because he says, I, I've i been set up on, like, eight, on, on uh, dates with, like, seven or eight Lana's and, like, 17 Lois's. And I'm like... I don't know if this is like the 90s or the 2000s. There's actually more Lana's running around than Lois's. Lois is like an older, outdated name at that point. I actually think that should have been flipped. I think I think he'd be dealing with more Lois's. And also, if Lois is that common of a name, are they all getting set up on dates with Clarks? Like, uh, it's a yeah, minor point, but I didn't really buy that. As somebody who like constantly has to hear Austin Powers and uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin jokes. I can kind of buy it. Maybe the uh, being set up with Clarks is like a step too far. I but, can see uh, the, the occasional person going, oh, haha, Lois like Lois Lane, but really, really set up on dates. Um, I honestly thought that her last name was going to be Lane and that somehow Kurt Busick was going to make me buy it. Mm-hmm. I thought that's where that was going. I did wonder that, and then I was like, I'm kind of glad we didn't go there. And I also am glad we didn't give him a Lex or a Jimmy, because I was waiting for it. Especially because, so the thing is, I am I would have been very open to all of that just to see how exactly he handled it. Like, mm-hmm. retroactively having read the whole thing, I like how more realistic and, again, understated it is. But I think he could have made it work. Yeah, like you, maybe you could. More. I think the issue, and it was something that I was a little bit worried of when we got to Lois, was just that we would keep stepping in to go, okay, and now here's Lex. Okay, and now here's Jimmy. Okay, now here's Perry. You know what I mean? But it or also like... just depends on what the point of the piece is. And at that point in the book, I didn't know yet. So exactly. it, it was looking more and more like the point of this is the world is be like he's becoming – Superman, his life is becoming more like Superman's life, and the world is becoming more of a Superman universe that revolves around him. And ultimately, it isn't that isn't really what it is. Like it kind of stops at Lois. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Even because I figured when we got uh, that Lois is pregnant, I was like, okay, we're doing a car, right? Like this is where we're going. Oh, I didn't and have then... that thought. That would have been. Like... Kind of weird, though, because that's that's not, like, Superman's daughter. It's not, but, like, that is, like, your Supergirl. I figured we would do both. I was like, okay, we have twins so that they can have Supergirl and Superboy. And then that's not at all where they go. Like, obviously, that's not exactly what it is in the comics, but, um, like, it's already changing stuff. Well, and based on, you know, and that that's fair. I, like, I didn't have that thought, but I could see your mind going there because of the Superman family thing where like she gives him a card. That's another thing where we see a golden age thing and that it actually is a, is a prop in the story where she gives him a a card that Superman family, I to, to try to cryptically tell him that they're having a kid and it's painfully obvious, but he's dense enough that he doesn't realize that that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with that, you have super, Supergirl and Superboy and crypto. So I would, that was part of it was, I was like, okay, we're going to, like get that kind of whole image, right? Like, it's well, I thought he was gonna get a dog, and that doesn't happen I had that either. Too. <laughs> Could have had a dog and named it Ace. <laughs> That's a subversion. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, where like he's he's sick of the Superman thing, so he accidentally names everything Batman things. Like, it's not even that he likes Batman; he just keeps picking Batman names at random. Yeah, just by accident. <laughs> that'd be that'd be weird. I. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate, I keep saying understated, um, I, I really appreciate how, for lack of a better way of putting it, just, like, morally centered this book is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Everything, really like, every piece of conflict that comes up, it's not just, how am I going to keep 
my secret identity. I mean, that's the that's the name of the book. That's the idea of the book. Uh, how am I going to pe- keep people from finding out who I am? How am I going to, to protect my wife and my children? But it's also what what is the the correct moral thing to do? And I really appreciate that he doesn't get inspired by Superman comics to have those values. He's he just is raised right. I I would I would like to get a little bit more with his parents. I did have that. I, I like. I, I wanted to know more about what his parents were like. But... I especially wanted them to come back because uh, they're only in that teenage issue. Yeah. Like I kind of assumed we would do a death of his parents thing, but we yeah. don't. That would have been good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially because like you're already doing the kind of cycle thing, but um, it's not like a big deal. But yeah, especially when we get toward the end, uh, a lot of your conflict is much more internal than external. And I will say we get to a place where I kind of wanted the stakes to be ramped up a little bit more. Like, I like that there's not a big villain plot. I like that it doesn't turn into Superman versus the government full on, I think. Uh, I didn't need to have, like you said, his version of Lex Luthor exactly. Uh, I did... I did think that it wound down a little bit too early. That's fair. Like, uh, what I liked about that it was like, here are all the things we've set up about his life, and now he's kind of coming to the end. And instead of you know like some sort of big end that everything wraps up, it's we just get like little moments where it's like, okay, now uh, his Gordon uh, Malloy is retiring. Um, he's just kind of getting slower, so he can't really do the Superman thing. Like, it felt very, like, true to life in that way. That was yeah. something I really appreciated. Because uh, especially earlier on in the issue, you have set up where he's like, okay, um, the government's calling me less and less to do missions for them. I'm pretty sure they have other super people. And I was like, okay, we're, we're setting up a villain here. Like, he's getting weaker. They're doing that. Like, I'm not entirely sure how this is going to go, but we'll see. And uh, then he's going to stop a tornado and he's like, oh, somebody else stopped it. And I was like, "Okay, like, uh, what are we doing here? And then he goes, I heard two voices. And it's like, oh, no, we're just doing the daughters. And then we like completely move away from that. And I I don't know. I I really liked how it was handled. Yeah. Was there because when I got to the end of the last issue, uh, I felt like that whole thing was really heartfelt, and the writing throughout is just wonderful. It, it, it's just lovely, and it was satisfying on an emotional level. But the the writer in me was was like, and and I don't mean that everything has to be structured the same. Or I'm looking for a formula, but the writer in me was like, but where's the rising action? Where's the mm-hmm. where's the tension? Where's your um where's where's your climax and climax is relative right like it it isn't that every Mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not just talking about this in comparison to superhero stories i just mean storytelling yeah you're not Uh, saying like he should be fighting like a giant monster at the end like you just think that it needed more of a climax for what the story is it it's a question before it's a criticism yeah absolutely i i wonder if i'll feel more solid about it on another read but like so the strongest word I'll use is reservation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a reservation about how little conflict there is in the back half. Yeah, for sure. Uh, no, I mean, I I can definitely understand what you're saying. I think for me... It I do love me Superman over... versus a tornado. Yeah. And it's fun that it's not in Kansas. Oh, that's true. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, it's okay. Uh, I was just saying, like, for me, I think it won me over. And it felt like one of the places where it made sense to break the rules uh, in that way. Yeah, and that's where the memoir thing, like, really shines and where maybe on a, on a second read I won't have that feeling at all because I know what kind of thing I'm reading. I, mm-hmm. I, I didn't... I guess the thing is, by the halfway point, I was very open to it turning more comic booky. I don't mean that I needed it to, but that's what I thought it was going to do. And I think I was blindsided by how, for lack of a better word, like literary and short story it is. Like, isn't it interesting that this is a comic about a fictional comic character that I uh, inspires kind of and a, a, a character and he is sort of forced into a place where he where he becomes that guy, but it isn't told like a traditional superhero comic 
Like it's not yeah. like I said earlier, it's not comic booky. Um, so like, and it's not cutesy about the medium either. Mm -hmm. But it also isn't wishing it was in some other medium. Like I said, graphic novel before comic book. Yeah, like it, it kind of feels like a just a good novel, but as a comic, and I think that's really cool. Yeah, I think you could do this as a pro story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think it would work effectively. But I think this is really effective as well. Um, the it, big thing you lose is those like really, really powerful uh, two-page spreads. Yeah, Where, like you really highlight just a moment of his life. Uh, that and just the, like the final image of the books really, uh, really pretty. Yeah, and as few and far between as they are, I think the golden age images are uh, are kind of nice for contrast. Mm -hmm. And just give you give you a sense of like this is where it started. This is what the fiction is, and then here's the quote unquote like real life where it it maybe makes the whole thing feel more like it's really happening and puts you more mm -hmm. in you know the the contrast of those golden age images versus versus the uh, like lush scenery shots that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, there's that really nice moment where it's kind of him reflecting on his life overall, and you get uh, just like several panels back to back where it's like here is just his life, and it's like golden age art style, like silver age art style. Like I was going to ask like, you how you felt about that. Uh, I thought it was really cool, and then it ends on uh, like Bruce Tim. <laughs> yeah, it was Bruce Tim long enough that it took me a minute to realize all the different styles it was doing. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't yeah. know why this suddenly switched to, oh, wait, we were doing this for a while, and I just missed it. <laughs> uh, no, I thought that was really cool. Uh, I, this is one of those like weird page layout things where it would have been cool if it was all in one page, but it's like the last two panels of a page are the start of it, and then the next page is the rest of it. And that's just like a random uh, nitpick, but like that would have been cool if we could have managed to get it all in one page. It, the the other thing I like about doing it as a comic book, besides the fact that more people are going to read it that way, I, I mean not not that I I just mean versus if you did it as a prose story, right? Like, I uh, because this is also a thing that you could do like like as a as a film or a miniseries or something. I guess I, I you would only want to do that in a world where Superman is more popular. We're doing a lot more Superman stuff because you wouldn't want this to be the one Superman movie you got in like ten years. Uh, but that there's... would have to be a miniseries, I feel like. Yeah. Where, like, each episode is, does is structured like an issue in this. Can I argue that you could do it in vignettes, though, and still keep it under two hours? Yeah. But I'm yeah, with you. Sure. I think it's probably more effective as a miniseries. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't mind seeing this on screen. Or you, or you could do it as one of those animated movies, maybe. Yeah, the issue with that is just, like, uh, time. Like, I, I think the best way yeah. is a miniseries where you recast everybody, um, like, a, to a certain degree, uh, like, between episodes. Okay, but I'd like, rather – oh, that's a good idea. But I'd rather see this attempted in 75 minutes than All-Star. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. When you compare it to other things they've attempted, they've got a lot of real estate for this story. <laughs> That's true. I'm just saying. Uh, something else that I that I really appreciate about uh, doing this in I started to say this a second ago. I uh, in comic art is uh, it's like it's it's a it's visually handled well enough, but it's not a real like visually told story. What I mean is it reads like illustrated prose much of the time, and. I really like that aspect about it. Like a, a lot of people prefer their comic art to be really cinematic and it's all very action driven. And this is just not that kind of thing. Right. So yeah, it it's, it's story. a, it's a writer telling his story and none of, you can't even call it internal monologue. It's, it's, you know, it's first person like narrative writing. Um, he's, he's writing a book that will never get published. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, and he is, we didn't really talk that much about this. He's a published author who writes nonfiction. He writes like sociology books and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, by the way, all of the premises for his books went over my head. Oh yeah. Uh, like in what way, what do you mean? I mean, I didn't understand what the what his books were about. Oh, okay, yeah. Did you have that? Like, like every time you'd be like, "This is a metaphor for this," and I'm like, "I don't know what any of that means." <laughs> I felt, I, I felt really, uh, kind of dense. Well, the only book I didn't know what he was talking about. 
The only book that I remember that they talked about that he wrote was the one about just how he sees the world and people, which is like from the view of being an outsider. Well, and, and no, but but that one, he wasn't even sure if he was going to write it. He was like, that's maybe a book. I don't know if that's a book. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we know when we jump uh, to the next issue, to the last issue, he does because that's oh. the that's the book that uh, his daughter's boyfriend is like, oh, my God, your book is so good. We read it in sociology class. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, OK, suck up. <laughs> well, and, and – I, I guess I'm not just talking about books because we're we're told about articles early on, and the premises for those I didn't know what, what we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Like I, I had to, I had to look them over two or three times, and I still wasn't a hundred percent sure about the premise. Like like some of the political stuff, I was like, I don't really know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, none of them are coming to me, so I'm like having a hard time I'm, being I'm, like, yeah, I'm having that right now. So I'm like, oh, this one was this, but because that's the only one I remember off the top of my head, because it's kind of the most important of his books. No, it totally in is. this book, but. Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't have that as much. But, but something, something else this does, I uh, with with the comic art, and I don't, I don't, I don't know if you had this. I don't know how much of it was intentional, but um, it, certain faces were recognizable enough. I feel like I can make this point. There are occasional panels where Clark or Lois will be drawn to look like actors. Oh, interesting. Uh, which actors were you thinking of? So there is one place in particular where he's very George Reeves, and then a couple pages later, he's Christopher Reeve. And there's one shot where Lois is drawn to look very Noel Neal. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. See, that's something you're going to have more than me just because you're more familiar with that stuff. Well, and I'm a screen uh, Superman fan than I am before I'm anything else. Yeah. Um, I had it in a few places with Christopher Reeve, but... I'm, like, notorious for just being like, ah, all Supermans look like Christopher Reeve. Yeah. (laughs) There's one shot in particular where it felt like it was all, and I'm sure Imanen, Imonen didn't do this, but it, but there's, there's one place where it looks like he almost traces a a classic Christopher Reeve facial expression. Mm -hmm. Um, it was impressive to me that I Lois ever looked like anybody else because she's a totally different ethnicity, which I thought was a cool choice. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, I thought so that was cool, her, too. Her heritage is from India. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and... Uh, Which we also it took kinda... me a whole issue to pick up on. I, oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, well, because I just wasn't really paying that much attention to the last name. Well, yeah. And so it the, the, the heritage aspect of it had to come up, and it felt like... This is going to sound weird, but it felt like she was being drawn more and more to look specifically Indian the more the book went. Where, like, by the fourth issue, I'm like, well, if she looked like this when we first met her, I would I would be able to tell where she comes from. But I it didn't sure look like that was... early on. And, th- and then when you get to the different art styles at the end, her skin tone gets a lot darker. <laughs> yeah, when she was first introduced and they're like, you know, this is Lois, I was like... Is she is she supposed to be Indian? Is that what we're doing? I can't really tell. And then when they gave the last name, I was like, oh, okay. Um, she definitely is. I also like lived in a city that was like a lot uh, like predominantly Indian people uh, when I was in high school. So maybe like it was just like easier for me to catch on to because of that. Well, my first uh, serious girlfriend in high school was 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 Indian. Her whole family was was. It from was there. this woman, in fact. It was Lois. <laughs> uh, this was a year after we broke up, though. Her last name. <laughs> exactly, and they were like, "Oh, Lois, you should go out with this guy, James. <laughs> you should go out with this guy. He's named after Wolverine." <laughs> well, James is kind of like Jimmy. <laughs> uh, a couple other quick observations. Uh, I thought it was uh, kind of a neat idea to have Clark and Lois, uh, because they're both so uh, sick of the jokes about their names, uh, they're so sensitive to that, not naming their kids after Superman characters, but then their kids who grew up with powers and love the whole Superman thing then turn around and do that. And I wonder what that cycle looks like. Like, if yeah, then their true. kids don't, but then their kids do, but then their kids don't, but then their kids do. <laughs> well, I was also surprised with the names of the daughters because it's, what, Jane and Search of the Sea. Um, 
something that I, my mind's going to Charlotte, but it's not it's, Charlotte. It's Carol and Jane. Carol and Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, earlier on when they're like, okay, if we have a boy, it'll be this or this. And uh, she wants to name him after her dad. And yeah. Clark, Clark wants to name him, I don't know, like Jack or whatever. I can't remember. He's uh, like just, just some, you know, good old school American name. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And then you so, use her dad's name as the middle name. Yeah, so I was a little surprised when we got the names of both because I was like, oh, like they're having twins. So like surely one of them One of them should have... be an Indian name. Exactly. I was a little surprised we didn't do that. Good call. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, they're Carol and Jane. Okay. <laughs> that's a little weird. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting about this, uh, and I don't have a real deep read on it just to say that this is an interesting observation, uh, is that it's a Superman story that ultimately feels kind of quintessential to me. Like, he very much embodies those values, and it, it's, kind of, it's kind of a cool, you know, not overly cutesy way to have a... I like Superman not from Krypton that still feels, you know, very much like that character by the end, but it's not an immigrant story at all. Mm -hmm. No, I feel like you could uh, do a Superman movie just in the tone of this kind of like, you know, the way Gunn talks about it with all star where like that movie probably won't have any plot points from that book, but like tonally that's what they're looking at. Um, if you're not going to adapt the straight for like a miniseries, like we were talking about earlier, I could see making a Superman that just feels like this book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause I had the same thing. I was like, this is weird and how quintessential it feels. Cause it's not exactly Superman. Like it is a different concept, but like, it's still, it's very much in line. It's kind of like what you talk about with Batman where like you can reinterpret Batman in so many ways. Like this is a place where you're doing it with Superman and kind of doing I, obviously, I haven't seen them because my eye thing, but uh, but I've always <laughs> yeah. heard people talk about with those uh, Spider Verse movies, which is you know just uh, you kind of fill the suit. Yeah, uh, the the idea that you could have a totally different kind of background, but then but still get to the same place. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and with Superman, he probably has to be he probably has to feel like an outsider in some way and that works pretty well with this. And I like how much of it is just a personality thing. I, I like, like I like the point that's made of, I, uh, he, even before he got powers, when he would get big news about something, he has to run off to like essentially a fortress of solitude or he's got to get like away from everything. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not a person that, rushes into crowds he's not a real social guy uh but it just it it feels like it should be a cheat to have a real honest to god superman story that isn't about uh immigration or isn't about being an immigrant because that's what especially these days that's the big thing that a lot of people go to in arguing no superman can be a relatable character he's the quintessential immigrant and, and this feels like Superman, but he isn't that. Well, and what's cool, too, because this is something you can only do in this type of book where it's a character who knows about Superman, is that he's almost like a self-imposed uh, immigrant for a while, where it's like, I have Superman powers. Surely I'm not, like, from Earth. Like, surely I am some sort of thing that's kind of out there that's yeah. not connected. And my parents are not really my parents. Uh, so you have some of that uh, just kind of self-imposed in that way and then obviously you also have it just being like a personality type well and i like the, kind of the other side of it with what it may be saying about i uh, like the i uh, the american experience for like like people that are actually from here in the first place you know what i mean that mm -hmm. when when uh, that that you you can you can maybe come to those uh same values and there's something to be said about the old school quote unquote american way even even if you don't have the immigrant experience it's just kind of cool to get the other side of that mm -hmm. yeah exactly he very much just comes from the american way instead of adopting it uh, so yeah, with with one read, I I liked this a lot. Like I said, I had I had reservations about uh, lack of conflict in 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 the second half. I, uh, but 
I'm interested to give it another read and see if I still have that. Yeah, and I have one big question that I'm yeah. not entirely sure what's going on with it. So when he gets captured by the government, I was a little unsure why they just couldn't get his identity through that, uh, either with like DNA or whatever. Um, cause they do have him for at least like a, a day or so. And they say that they got his fingerprints. So I guess... Th- I guess if he never did any crime, they wouldn't be able to match it. Mm-hmm. That was the only thing I could figure. Yeah, possibly. But uh, I just wasn't sure about no, it. No, I had the same thing, and I, I felt, and that's part of why I was a little bit. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get more negative now that you said that. <laughs> but uh, that, that's part of why I was frustrated with the last issue because I felt like Busick was maybe going out of his way to make all of that too easy so that he didn't have to, like maybe it wasn't exactly the natural way to go. So it was kind of refreshing that it didn't have to turn into like an, like an ET situation full blown Mm -hmm. where the government's coming after him. What is he going to do about that? I liked how difficult it was for him to even establish a relationship with them in the first place of any kind. And the way they kept poking at him and kept trying to find ways to make it political, even though he said he wasn't going to help them, with anything politically, he's like, I'm not gonna go topple regimes. I'm not gonna, I like, like I'm not gonna help you with anything, you know, politically to help people get elected. But then they would put him in positions where he has to do to to do what they want him to because he will save lives. But it is for them more about getting somebody elected or it's uh, motivated. Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 motivation is we're still on top in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Um. So I I really appreciated all of that, but it felt like he was going out of his way to make it, like you said, harder for the government to figure out who he is than it should be. Because after all, and maybe it's just because they worked so closely together, but his Gordon is is you as you called him, I. Uh, that agent that's working with him, well, he figured it out. Mm-hmm. And then he just keeps it a secret and never tells the government. And I, I felt like they would have, his his up and ups would have gotten frustrated too much in his not figuring anything out about Superman, that they would have put somebody else in charge of that, or they would have, like, had even more campaigns to go after him and figure him out, I would have thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what I liked about that initially was that, like, it, it wasn't too easy. Like, they were able to figure out who he was. Uh, but then that guy, it's almost like Superman kind of rubs off on him in a way where it's like he doesn't out Superman to uh, his higher ups. So I kind of like that, where it's like, you know, kind of teaching the better way. But then it also doesn't answer the question I had. Uh, with him being kidnapped, because then he also says, you know, just so you know, I wasn't around when that happened. Yeah, he was like, that was that was the previous people in charge. I was like, well, what happened to them? And like, is it just about whoever's in the White House right now? Because. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or he could have just been like a new agent, like a new hire at that point. Yeah, uh, but slightly after that. But what I'm saying is you still would have had people above him that would I'm reading between the lines and going the reason you've got an agent working with Superman isn't just so that he can help save people. It's so they can get to him. And I don't think that would have changed. Mm -hmm. No. And they're still doing that, which is also a nice detail. Like you have a moment, but they're uh, not working um, hard enough. And that's what, that's what was weird about it for me. Yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, I think because I was like, okay, now that they're working together, we're kind of going to clean this up a little bit and they don't fully. So it's maybe not, as far as they would go, but I was kind of surprised that they went there. I sorry, I, I took a, a a picture of a um panel because I wanted to. I just remember this because I wanted to ask you about this line. Yeah. Um. In in the narration because I was very confused about it. Yeah. I and t- t- tell me uh, if I'm just dumb. So <laughs> you're dumb. Elderly. Okay. Thank you. I needed that you're confirmation. Welcome. I. <laughs> I so elderly Clark grows a beard mm-hmm. and he says, I always wanted one, but didn't want to risk it for security. Now I've got one and Lois won't let me shave it. What what is what is having a beard have to do with security? I think the idea is that uh, if he has like a specific beard, 
uh, it's like another thing to identify you with. Oh, that because makes one sense. of the things. When okay, you, I do feel dumb. There you go. You no, know, it's it's okay because I had to think about it for a second. Like when you, you said sh- it, I was like, see, see, most people are looking for validation. I need people to confirm that I'm dumb. <laughs> No, it took me a second because I was like, uh, what? And then I thought about it and I was like, oh, okay, it's this. Because when he meets the government, he puts like – he has like cheek fillers or something. like He like stuffs, stuffs his mouth with cotton or Oh, something. I missed that. Like, it's something like that. Like we kind of like fills out his face a little bit to make himself look a little different, which is also what we do with the glasses, uh, which is that – uh, somebody that's now seen his face when he's kidnapped maybe wouldn't recognize him with glasses if they're like across the street and they spot him. And see, that's that obvious thing that you got to do because it's a Superman story. But Busick makes it so realistic mm-hmm. that I wasn't like, ah, it's too cutesy that you got the glasses thing in there. And also, some of it's the attitude that Eminem has and how he draws it. Yeah, because. For sure. It, he doesn't do these big splashy reveals of this is the moment where he finally puts on glasses. You know, it's not that Smallville thing where you would, like, make a big reveal out of it. And you'd have, like, you know, irritating music that tells you you're supposed to be feeling something now. Like, they, like that's that's not that's not how it feels. It's like, that feels like it. it's a natural story point. Because uh, he says... Well, it's not going to – because, again, this is supposed to be a more realistic world than, we, than the one we live in. So he's like, well, it's it's not going to help me on the day-to-day with people I work with. But I just got kidnapped and I, I – and experimented on by the government, and I wasn't there long enough for them to really remember my face, hopefully – so so I'll just put these glasses on and then if any of them see it, see me, maybe they won't recognize. Like, that makes a lot of sense that he would do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's not supposed to be like, oh, well, I have glasses so now they can't recognize me. It's like in a moment. Like if an agent's across the street and they see him, they, they maybe won't think won't, twice. They won't think twice. They'll just be like, okay, that's a different guy. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and there's a cool thing. What else could you do? Like – if you wore a wig, then people that know you would be like, why are you wearing a wig? Like, it, mm-hmm. it's literally the only thing you could do to slightly change your face and get people off your trail. Like, it's really smart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you can't just grow a beard instantaneously in that in that scenario. No, and then for security reasons, apparently, <laughs> then you can't do it that would be a mistake, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think there's a cool thing that uh, Eminem does in the art where, like, I, I feel like his Superman face is a little bit wider uh, when he's talking to the government people. And then when Malloy says, like, oh, I know you're Clark, it, like, goes back down to his Clark face. But I could be wrong about that. Like, it oh, could interesting. Be me. I didn't notice that. I mean, we can but roll think, back and I try think to... that was a thing. We can roll back and try to look at that, I guess, but... It'll take me a minute to get there. <laughs> I feel like that's a thing that happened. I was like, let's reread the whole book like backwards. Slimmer between panels, but we're gonna read. We're, we're gonna reread um, the entire book backwards. No, we would have passed it. It's in that last issue. Oh, it's in the last issue. Oh, sorry. yeah, because it's the one where he's like, "I'm retiring." Sorry, I thought you were talking about like when they first meet. No, no, it's uh, yeah, it would be in. I guess not this scene. This is riveting, I'm sure. Yeah, this is absolutely <laughs> fascinating. It's like when I'm Googling things. Uh, you maybe just don't have the panel. I've got all the pages here. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm dumb. I don't know. Uh, well, I thought I had all the pages here. It does seem actually shorter than it should, so I'm not sure. Well, anyway. Weird. I'll look for that next time I read it. <laughs> it was somewhere. I, I think I'm right about that, but I could be wrong. Uh, this is a good book. Everybody should read it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, check this out if you haven't read it. And like I said, I, I this is the kind of stuff I most like from Busick. When he just mm-hmm. goes, like, real character-driven uh, and puts kind of a kind of an emphasis on... Uh, I, I hesitate to say... Uh, you know, like like quote unquote emotionally driven things, but just the the emphasis on like the like like the personal impact that I like like superhero stuff has on people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. He's just really good at that. He's I, I guess human element. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, this feels superhuman, and uh... and he's really good at writing about writers. <sighs> mm-hmm. Like he's yeah, about absolutely. the best in the business with that because you go back to Marvels with with uh, the the not Ben Urit guy, and 
like that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I still need to read the Marvels. I forgot that was Busick actually. For some reason, I thought it was just Ross, but no, that's that is Busick. both of them. Yeah, I yeah I when I met Kurt Busick, I made him incredibly uncomfortable by oh, no. by by singing his praises with that book because that that was that was a huge book for me, <laughs> and uh, you know I don't think I was obnoxious and gushing. I was just like. Marvel's is a big deal to me, and I'm irritated for not realizing you were going to be at this convention and not bringing it for you to sign. I because I met him at I uh, at at one of the Superman celebrations, and I don't typically go there specifically for comic guys, so I just didn't look up the comic guys. They usually don't have a lot, and that was one of the bigger names that they that they they've had. And I uh, I was like, oh crap, Busick's here. I gotta find abusive books. So I found I uh, like some random issue of Justice League or something he wrote there at that con just so that I could have him sign something. It would have uh, been really funny if just happenstance you like found an issue of this while you were there. That would have been to great. Sign it. And like you know, that's how you find out what it was. Yeah, I'm like, I've never read this, but it looks cool. I <laughs> uh, but no, I I, th I think I made him mildly uncomfortable with that. I uh, but <laughs> Turn it around because uh, we took we took a selfie together and that was fun and then I posted it and then everybody talked about he, how he looks like me but like twenty five years older. Oh, I remember you telling me that. Yeah, that was pretty funny. That's he must that's uncomfortable when he reads the. It's on my Facebook. Read somewhere. the untold story because that also sings the praise of that book. <laughs> yeah, because it's great. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mar Marvels is one of everything at Marvel sucked, but then the Marvels happened, and the Marvels was really good. And that was one of those books that they almost couldn't get made because of what it was, and they didn't think anybody would read it because mm -hmm. yeah, it wasn't commercial and splashy like, enough. Yeah, they didn't think anyone would like Ross's art. It's crazy to think about now. Isn't that nuts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fact that that even exists is kind of mind blowing. Just Ross doing that much interior art and the climate at the time. Like, if you think, and also th think about this with Marvels. Uh, that's like 96, I think. Mm -hmm. Just 10, 12 years later, I, it, it, it wouldn't be at all shocking to see DC or Marvel put a book like that on the shelf. Like, like, like just a decade later, the, the like deconstruction you know, kind of more sophisticated what if superheroes were in the real world kind of thing was got really in vogue really quickly. Mm -hmm. But like like just a decade earlier, you almost couldn't sell a book like that, they thought. And then yeah, of course well, it was just huge like six... because there wasn't anything like it before that. Yeah, and even just like six years later, like he did the concept work for uh the first Spider Man movie. And then obviously, you know, yeah, with the second one, he does the um, credits art. I'm sorry, I was reading a comment. Who who does the credits art? Uh, Alex Ross. Oh yeah, in 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 movies, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like just six years later, like he yeah. Was apologies, doing I just I missed some Spider Man. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's just like amazing. Like when you think about that. Yeah, how huge he got. Yeah. <laughs> and but outside of Marvels, he's known mostly for covers. Like a, a lot of people that have never read Marvels don't even realize that he did interiors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like Kingdom Come uh, covers and the Marvels. I would say are like the biggest things he's known for. Yeah, and he's done full interiors for other stuff, just not a ton. Like I want to say he did all of the Space Ghost mini, but I oh interesting that DC yeah. did, but I could be wrong about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm trying to remember, did he... I know he did the covers, and if he didn't do the interiors, somebody aped him really well. I just can't remember. Well, I think he did the art for that uh, Earth X book we did, right? I don't think that was all him. I think somebody else was... Yeah, I couldn't remember for sure. Working on that. It's that would have been way too many pages for him. Uh, that is true, too. I, I just think... knew that he wrote it, so I was like... You would have seen it take a decade for that book to come out, I would, <laughs> I would think. I need to reread that. We loved it. Yeah, and that was that was an interesting case because that was a book where it took like two or three issues for us to realize like how great it was. Both of us were like, "God, this is a chore." And then we got to issue four, we messaged each other. And it was like, "Oh, this just got good." And it was like, "Oh, this is what it was doing." Yeah. Oh, okay, so now I need to reread it. Now I assume on a on a reread, all of that tracks and in, in in is more interesting. Yeah, exactly. That's just one of those books where like you got to get all the balls in the air to juggle and you just have to trust it. And we weren't given it enough faith. 
Uh, Tom Atkins, anything unique to this book you'd like to see in Gun Superman? Not story point wise or character wise. Like tonally, this is what the the like young period in Smallville should always feel like. Uh, I think Lois Lane should bomb a fair. <laughs> <laughs> that movie. I thought you were going to say Lois Lane should be from India. No, that's that's who we'll get in the next one. It'll be like MJ uh, with Homecoming, oh, like the new Spider-Man. The, the big twist is going to be Lois Lane is the bad guy? Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. And then we'll introduce the real Lois Lane in the next movie. Yeah, she'll bomb a fair and then she'll be like, "My like you knew my name was Lois, but it's actually Lois Luther." Oh, wow. Whoa. I didn't see that coming. And then she takes her wig off and she's also bald. <laughs> Just so you really know. I See, I don't know why you're not writing this movie. I it, know, It hurts right? my feelings I'm never going <laughs> to see that on screen. It would be the greatest moment in all of cinematic history. And then can, it turns out it's Lex squared. Can I, can I, can I add, can I add one line? Yes. That I think really, really clenches the whole thing. Mm-hmm. The whole movie, she's been wearing a pin that's a L, and and Superman's like, oh, does the L stand for Lois? No, the L stands for Luthor. You know, Clark, you've always asked me what my pin stood for. It stood for Luthor. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't think in the, in the new movie, I I mean, this wouldn't be there anyway. Nobody's going to be able to say the S stands for hope because I'm not convinced anybody looks at that symbol and immediately sees an S. <laughs> when you've got just the slash through it, like the outline, may, for anybody that, that hasn't seen it, they're basically doing the Kingdom Come S and the outline red makes it look a little bit more like an S, but I don't know that anybody would immediately look at that and go, oh, look an S. That's always been my issue with the Kingdom Come logos. I'm like, that's just a dash. Um, I, I've harped on this before, but I like it, and I like Kingdom Come and you don't, but I like it in the context of that book mm-hmm. as a thing that he does much later after the established as. I don't know how I'm going to feel about opening with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in terms of that, like I, I think it'll be fine, but uh, I, I like it a little bit more I because we'll I like that it has like the the yellow border it makes me see it a little bit more as an ass yeah but like it's still the kingdom come logo <laughs> my my problem is that logo is just too specific to that book like it's all thematic story stuff to mm-hmm. to me with with kingdom come and so hopefully he wins me over on it and he's he, he picked it for a real reason but i just don't want it to feel like bvs where it's like dark knight returns for no reason or the, just the you know, we picked it because it's a logo we've never done on film. Yeah, it could come off that way. Mm. No, I, I'm sure he's picked it for a good reason. We'll see. But I, I mean, hopefully. Mm-hmm. My big question is just, will Supergirl have the same ass or will she have a different one? Yeah. Because I could see it going either way. Well, and I also think that there's a chance, and I was saying this when we thought the title was still going to be Legacy, but it, this still could totally hold we don't know how long he's been superman or like how how much of a history there is so like if he's been in the suit for five or ten years this could be the third or fourth logo he's had Mm -hmm. no that's true too or if you know they were going with legacy it could be more of like the like house of l thing and we just like separated it more from the s yeah in that way yeah, I we'll mean, see. I'm I'm a purist when it comes to Kryptonian language. Like, I want I want them to do you know the the, the classic symbols, but they might have built a whole new alphabet around alphabet around it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or maybe they won't do anything with Krypton. Like, who knows? It's so they may not. Just gotta wait and see. <laughs> we have a logo. That's all we got. <laughs> yeah, because we haven't cast the Drell or anything. No, we haven't even cast the Kents yet. Um... <laughs> there also are not Kents. We don't have Kents. We don't have L's. Well, he'll go home to his parents and they'll be like, Ma and Pa, uh, you know, Lois turned out to be a Luthor. And then they'll go, so are we. <laughs> We're Ma and Pa Luthor. <laughs> Plus, EDX says the actor is like 35. Right. That 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 means that he could have been Superman for at least a decade. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, we know he'll at least have been active for a few years. So, Yep. And we know that uh, Gunn likes... We're just doing another speculation cast. We, 
we know we know Gunn we, with with you know the Suicide Squad specifically, um, you know wants to come in and have a living, breathing universe already. I uh, so I I like that we're gonna already be in kind of a pre-established world and have to catch up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Especially because we started with origin territory with the last failed continuity. You know, we've we've sat there for the last 11 years. So it'd be nice if this felt like we had 11 years of continuity and they were good. <laughs> and we'll just move on now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I feel like you, you kind of had to do the Batman thing with Superman where... Like, it's still early, but we didn't need to do another full origin movie. Yeah. Obviously, don't do the Spider-Man thing and completely ignore your origin. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... no, no, no Kent's Noels. <laughs> exactly. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a stickler for that. That's really important to me. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get, like, picket signs that say no Kent's Noels. <laughs> no Smallville either. Yep, I don't want that. I don't he'll, want meet, crap. he'll meet CGI Christopher Reeve and be like, I remember growing up in Smallville and David Cornsweet will be like, huh? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, if this doesn't, if the first frame isn't Superman punching Brainiac in the face, I'm out. <laughs> if it's not him punching Mixelplex through a Walmart <laughs> and then into a 7-Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? It doesn't it doesn't matter who the villain is as long as it's someone I've heard of and not Lex or Zod. <laughs> nah, I'm kidding. Uh, I mean, I, I I do want to get to big Superman villains eventually because yeah, he doesn't have the be- the best rogues gallery, but like he's got one, and some of those <laughs> characters can be cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at the same time, it's like it's hard to say because it's like I also want to see new villains, but also. It's maybe not the worst idea to do a very back to basics Lex movie. Yeah, it's as long as and it's, it's good is. and people like it and you're making more. Because it would exactly. really suck if this whole thing fails and it's yet another Superman movie with the same villain mm-hmm. that yeah. we never get to anybody else. And don't do, I will say this at this point, don't do Zod again ever. I agree with that. Just don't, um, just don't even do it. There's no, there's no point at this, you know, now. I also feel like doing Zod and, and Brainiac is like somewhat of a double beat, or could be like just do Brainiac. Let's not do Zod again. Yeah, I mean they are really, really different characters, mm-hmm. but I... I just mean like in terms of like your alien kind of invasion. It's just we've or... done we've we've done Zod so much, and I don't want all your threats to be Kryptonian threats. Mm-hmm. So the only way. I would think you'd want to have Zod or something like Zod would be if Brainiac wasn't from Krypton. Mm-hmm. Because what if we did... that's not a given either, right? Like, you know, modern day, we always make Krypton or Brainiac from Krypton. And I like the, the Krypton Brainiac in an uh, animated series specifically, but he's not always from Krypton. Mm-hmm. He didn't start yeah. out that way. Yeah, he doesn't have to be. I don't think. Uh, I think what we do is we do Zod in the first movie. Then in the second movie, after Zod dies, we take his brain and we make an AI out of it, and it becomes Brainiac. Oh, okay. And then uh, somebody's, like, messing around with uh, Zod's body, and they accidentally bring him back to life, but they also shrink him, and he becomes Mixelplex. See, I, again, I don't know why. Like, I just got misty-eyed when you were talking. I don't know why we don't just let you write these things. I know. Um. <laughs> There actually is one way I would want to see Zod again, and this will n- probably never happen. The only the only way I would ever want to see that done again would be a full on Jarell movie, because yeah, that's the only way to do it. I agree because Jarell's background's got to have Zod in it. So mm-hmm. if you do another, because you know the TV show really you know screwed the pooch on that. If if you if you did a I uh, if you did a movie that was finally a big epic drill story, then you got to have Zod. But that's the, that's the only way I would want it. No, I agree with that. And I feel like at this point under gun, we could get that. Like, it's not necessarily a thing that they'll rush out to, but I could see them doing some sort of Krypton thing. Um, I, yeah, I wish they would. I well, could see that even being like as a, a Supergirl thing. No, I was going to say like a Krypton game. 
uh, oh, what, don't say games, that because like... now, now I want that. that <laughs> that'd be wonderful. Because we know that they're. I feel like we've had games. this conversation. The idea of a of a of a game where the end of it is Krypton explodes and you've got to like get the get the ship off the planet or maybe you're a Supergirl, you got to get off the planet. Like, there's so many cool things you can do with that game. You could do like a Majora's Mask thing with that too, where like part of the story is the inevitability and like you see like all the different people uh, on Krypton. You could do something cool with that, and I doubt they'll go super uh like important for any video game tie-in things like it's not going to be like here's like a big batman story where we introduce like a lot of his major villains no it's got to be something that that is disposable that everybody doesn't have to play yeah it's got to be some sort of like tie-in thing where like it's cool if you have this but you don't need it that's also a good workaround for how do you do a superman related game and your character is vulnerable to anything Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, that's just like out of the box thinking, like Yeah, no, no, I would love that. That'd be that'd be the way to do it. But but if you did a Krypton movie, I uh, you could, you know, establish because we know they're doing a supergirl movie. You establish you establish your supergirl and then you make her one of the central figures in a Krypton flashback movie, so you have somebody that anchors it that you're already familiar with. So it doesn't have to be just the Jarell movie where you have to introduce him. And of course you can introduce the AI Jarell in a Superman thing and then that helps to anchor you. But if you had um Kara is kind of your your younger, like you know, wet behind the ears, like like uh Aizen kind of character I uh, and you show kind of you know a couple different sides of it where you've got the Candor stuff or I uh, you know wherever they're living I uh, and then you've got like the the Krypton City stuff I don't know that'd be that'd be really cool mm-hmm. yeah absolutely you could do that as a mini series for Krypton that too sure um or a game. You could have Jarell and now I'm just stuck on that. You could have Jarell and Kara playable. <laughs> Get that actress to come in and voice hours and hours of dialogue. Exactly. Okay, well, I hope you guys enjoyed our half an hour spoiler cast <laughs> on uh, things that might happen. Things in that will never happen. <laughs> the DCU with Superman. <laughs> exactly. And remember, the L stands for Luthor. Exactly. And remember to take off your wig when you're a Luthor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to go ahead and get going. We appreciate you. Uh, next time, we're doing more comics, Austin. Oh, cool. We're, we're in a comic uh, vortex right now. Mm-hmm. And next week, uh, Elliot Slater has asked us to read Batman Ego. Oh, awesome. Uh, I have that, and I've, I haven't read it yet. So I've never read that either. When I does... bought it when the Batman was coming out, and I was like, I need to make sure to read this before I see it. And yeah, I... is that like a late 80s thing? No, because... Uh... I don't know where that is, because I've never read it. But Darwin Cook's like late 90s, early 2000s that he's working I didn't even know that's who that was, yeah. Yeah. I just, I've heard that name, but I didn't know what it was. When he's got such a classic art style, I always oh. think he's older than he is. No, I, uh, yeah, I recognize these covers now. Mm-hmm. No, I've never read this. Uh, are we reading, like, the full and other stories book, or are we just reading that? Because that's, like, a short story. Well, I'm going to assume if it's just a short story that we'll read whatever the trade is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the trade is like Batman, Ego, and other stories. Hopefully we like the other stories. I think they're mostly like Catwoman things. Uh, Interesting. I think. Well, I'm glad that I'm that we're finally looking at that because I forgot that that was related to the Batman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was the big book that Matt Reeves was uh, going on about. Cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, well, that's what we're doing next time. Uh, hey, if you would like to make a request, uh, just know that we've got quite a backlog right now, but we'll get to it eventually. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash geekvolution. The $15 tier makes that possible. You only have to subscribe for one month. Uh, if you let it roll over past that and you stay on, uh, you'll stay in the queue, but don't feel like you have to do that. Uh, we will log your thing and get to it whenever we get there. Uh, you can request a comic miniseries, graphic novel, uh, what happens. Have you try to keep it between four, six issues in length if possible. And uh, you can ask for a movie or a TV pilot as well. And uh, so Ego is what we're doing next week. Austin and I are going to come back on Friday and try to review at least another season of Legion. 
uh, for the few people that will care about that. Uh, unless Austin hasn't started it yet. I haven't talked uh, to you about this. <laughs> that was the thing I was going to talk to you about. But uh... <laughs> Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Air that out on camera. If you If you haven't started yet, we might put it off. I... I have started it. It's more of a having trouble with it sticking with me. I don't know how much I'm going to have to say about it. I'm, I'm having exactly the same thing. I've only got four four episodes left, and it is falling out of my brain. Yeah, it's much more of a, like, I don't even know if it'll be interesting for me to be there <laughs> to review it. Like, it's, I don't know. Yeah, we might abandon it. I mean, I feel bad about that for folks that wanted to see us talk about it, but uh, that first video didn't get like a huge interest so like at least we did a thing on it I, i'm gonna finish watching it because i'm mm -hmm. enjoying it enough to that i'm curious to see how it ends uh but i don't know how great of a video that is mm -hmm. yeah like i'm i watched the first episode today and then like i was like okay i need to take a break uh, and then i found after like an hour i was like i don't remember anything about that first episode well so I was and like i'm in a rough if you place. thought the first season doesn't binge grade <laughs> yeah so you're probably not gonna want to have to do 10 of those in two days <laughs> well I, I watched the first one in three days so i was like i can definitely make it happen no no, I, no i'm sure i'm just saying i don't know that you'll want to mm -hmm. uh okay yeah. well austin and i are gonna do something on friday it might be a watch party mm -hmm. yeah we'll figure something out but anyway, I appreciate you guys. Uh, in the meantime, I oh, and uh, Captain Logan show tomorrow night. I uh, will will have the new uh, Joker trailer to talk about. And there's probably some other news I don't even know about. We'll see what's going on. Yeah, and I don't know when the Marvel or Disney stuff is being announced. I assume we're getting another Deadpool trailer. A lot of the stuff at CinemaCon has been just there. So like, I think Joker Joker is like the only thing that's really come out. Oh, that anybody else can even look at. Yeah, like they dropped uh, Beetlejuice footage, but it was just exclusive to the con and stuff like that. Well, that's nice for the people that paid to go to that con. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I, exactly. I, I like it when stuff's not leaked to everybody because that's not fair to the to the to the attendees. They especially because cons are expensive now. Like you, mm -hmm. you want to feel like you actually got something special. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and some like Comic Con stuff, it's like half and half. Um. We got the Superman logo, which we already kind of had, but like a more clear image of it. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to make that the lead in topic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. We'll talk about the Joker trailer for five minutes. And I don't have a lot to say about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. But anyway, thanks a lot for watching, guys. Uh, we will see you again real soon. I was Captain Logan, and we had the wonderful Austin the Day Ghost. Da, 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 da. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, everybody. See ya.